How's everyone doing? Good. Better? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, so today we're actually going to do something that's really fun for me. Uh, five years ago, God brought us on an adventure. I got a half hour to bring us through this and, and communion, so we're going to buckle up, okay? Um, I was a mechanic welder at a coal-fired power plant. I went to school for that. I had a great job with great benefits and great pay. God placed me right where I felt I was going to be the rest of my life until I hit retirement coast. Life was good. We had everything that the American dream gave you. Um, and at the age of 22, uh, we started, actually it was 23, we started uh, attending a small Bible study with about 15 people in the basement of a house. Uh, that turned into about 20, 25 in the living room of another house, which turned into about 35 in a fire training center, which ended up becoming a church called Impact. Uh, I was able to be, Lori and I, and, and Brooke and Casey, and a number of us, if you, you know who you are, uh, were able to start this out and be a part of a dream of saying, God, let's do something different. Now, what you said was very prophetic today. Uh, I'm not about remodeling. I'm about rebuilding. Why should we fix that which is broken instead of destroying that which is broken and rebuilding with something that's different and better and new? And, uh, and God brought us down this path. Um, God threw kind of a, I, call, I say God threw a curveball, and I started uh, going into seminary uh, thinking, God, I can be a mechanic welder, and I can have a heart for lost and dying people. That came after I asked God to do some, a very simple thing, and that was this. I said, God, give me your heart for lost people. Don't ever pray that unless you're ready to take it. Because I never cried, and then I just wouldn't stop crying. Because I got to see broken people for who they were. Uh, why do I do what I do? Because I care about a community more than you would ever imagine. God gave me that. I went into seminary, and I started pursuing credentials, and I got credentialed as a pastor. Uh, five years ago, this weekend was the first sermon I preached as the new lead pastor of Impact Ministries. I had not yet quit my job at Impact or at the LRS, but I had taken, Lori and I had taken a huge leap and said, okay, God, let's do this thing. And we started. So today we are going to be revisiting a sermon that I preached five years ago. Uh, and we're going to see that, isn't it amazing how God brings you down a massive path in five years? So today, I'm going to preach a sermon entitled, The Wealthiest Place on Earth. The graveyard is the richest place on earth. Because it is here that you will find all the hopes and dreams that were never truly fulfilled. The books that were never written, the songs that were never sung, the inventions that were never shared, the cures that were never discovered, all because someone was what? too afraid to take their first step, keep with the problem, or determined enough to carry out their dream. Les Brown said that. Interesting concept, isn't it? It brought me into a place where I just started asking a very simple question to myself five years ago. God, what are the unseen and unfulfilled promises in my life that I'm not going to fulfill unless I get uncomfortable? Now, I've explained it to some people before, but I'm going to tell you right now, your banker looks at you really weird when you drop a one off the front of your income. Like, they're like, I was told suicide. This is financial suicide you're committing. Um, how many people know that a lot of times, and this is a write-down, a lot of times for you to fulfill your destiny, it requires your discomfort. Let me say that again. For you to fulfill your destiny, it will always require your discomfort. Why? Because comfortable usually doesn't have destiny written on it. Discomfort does. Should we just be un uncomfortable? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when God opens the door and you look at the road and say, that looks uncomfortable, but the other side of that looks like destiny, start walking. I'm in the process right now of reading a book by Chris Vallotton uh, called Poverty, Riches, and Wealth. And before you get excited, uh, I'm not a prosperity gospel person. I'm a wealth gospel person. 
Do you see the difference? Wealth has everything to do with life, prosperity, and riches have everything to do with financial. So we need to be careful that we don't live in that. But I want to read for you a little excerpt from this book that will lay a foundation for today. Chris Valentin says here, uh, he says, I've discovered a principle in the kingdom that simply says this, if you can envision it, you can have it. If you can envision it, you can have it. That is not to say that we can selfishly name and claim things or say anything of that nature. Uh, the author of the book of Hebrews put it like this, by faith we understand that the, world, the words were prepared Sorry, the world was prepared by the words of God so that it is uh, seen was, sorry, I'm going to mess that up. So that what is seen was not made out of the things which are invisible. In other words, everything that God created in the visible realm is a manifestation of his imagination. The book of Genesis says that God made us in his own image and likeness. Genesis 127. What God imagined, we became. And apparently he was imagining himself because we were made in his likeness. The wisest king in the world, Solomon, articulated it like this. As he, a man, thinks in his heart, so he is. Proverbs 23, 7. There is something very powerful about our imagination, which many people from the dark side have perverted, causing most believers rarely to tap into it, or at least on purpose. Yet it is vision that shapes our lives and directs our destinies. What you imagine has a huge effect on who you are becoming. You are forming your outer world with your inner thoughts. Interesting concept, isn't it? The wealthiest place on earth. You know what? They say it's the graveyard. You know what I think it is? I think it's you. I think you represent the wealthiest place on earth. Not a graveyard. Why? Because that's a death mentality and a defeatist mentality. I believe everyone in this place is drawing breath. We have people in their 80s in here, 70s, 60s, all the way down to fifth grade because they're not allowed in the nursery or in Sunday school. Right? So as I look at this concept of truly living out that passion, it brings me to the book of Joshua. And if you have your uh, scriptures today, let's turn to Joshua 15. Joshua 15. We know it's interesting. Casey didn't know what I was preaching on. Pretty much already did it. Um, the children of Israel had been 40 years in a desert, 40 years of death, 40 years of damnation, right? 40 years with no hope. Uh, all because of what? Fear. They looked at the wrong thing. They didn't look at the, the grapes and the honey and the, the fertile crescent they were asked to occupy. They looked at what? Giants, fortified cities, military might and power. They're like, we are but a people, and they are a civilization. We can't do that. They have the armies and the walls and the giants. We have what? Just our God. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? So in Joshua 15, verse 13, we've already seen Joshua be given this mantle of authority from Moses. Moses go on the mountainside, be then taken from this place, and Joshua given that ability or that responsibility to lead what? The people. Any idea of what that looks like? This is millions of people. It was 40 years in a desert with nothing to do. It's a lot of people. Right? We have an entire new generation being raised and born who had not seen what? This is important. That's it. They didn't see the miracles. So he was reestablishing what? A culture and worldview in a generation. And so Joshua has walked this road, and there was one other person from the old life or the old way that was walking with them. And who was that person? Caleb. I'm going to tell you right now, Old Testament, I've got two heroes. I've got David, 
Why? Because that boy could worship, and he could screw up too. But he could worship. And two is Caleb. Why? Because Caleb had a tenacity that every one of us should walk in. So let's look at it. 15, starting in verse 13. In accordance with the Lord's command to him, Joshua gave to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, a portion in Judith, Kirith, Arba, that he, that is Hebron. From Hebron, Caleb drove out three Anakites. Everyone say Anakites. What are they? Giants. Okay, so Caleb's a giant killer. When we, when we say drove out, let's just real quick. Driving out is not like, hey, I'm going to move you out of here. Driving out is, hey, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to watch as the birds eat your flesh. Why? Because I'm now taking over your country. Why do I know that? You might be like, well, it doesn't say that. Well, I do know that because, number one, Caleb was a rule follower when it came to God's rules, and they were told to do what? Destroy everything and leave nothing alive. You're like, that doesn't seem like a loving God. Well, look at... There's a lot to that. That's not what I have time for today. But when he drove out these, when they said he drove them out, that means he killed them. Shashiah, Ahilamon, and Telma, descendants of Anak. Anak, six-fingered, six-toed giants. Nice guys. From there, he marched against the people living in Debar, formerly called Kirith Sefer. And Caleb said this, and interesting, I give my daughter... I know he worked on this. Yeah, in marriage to the man who attacked and captured Kirith Sefer. Whoever names their daughter, that is, we have a problem, right? And then Othiel, um, Othniel, son of Kethix, uh, sorry, Caleb's brother, took it, took it, so Caleb gave his daughter to him in marriage. We're going to stop there for a second. So Caleb is how old at this point? 80 to 85. 85, is that what it is? 85. He's 85 years old, and he's like, hey, I'm going to go, and I'm going to take what? The giants. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go take what's been given. This is the thing. Can you understand a passionate, powerful man like Caleb had to do what for 40 years? He had to understand what he saw and not be able to walk in it. You want to know the worst thing that could ever happen to a giant slayer is place him where there's no giants. Place him where there's no ability to walk in purpose. Place him in a babysitting, outer marker mentality lifestyle. 80-year-old Caleb is dying currently. He's dying. Not because of age. Not because of him being feeble. He's dying because they took away his power to be who God called him to be. Caleb understood what it meant to walk in purpose. Caleb was not an Israelite by birth. Did you guys know that? But he was an Israelite indeed in every other way. He was one of the chief spies sent out by Moses. He was courageous and persevered when the other spies didn't have the ability to be so. He was invincible when it came to driving out giants, completely devoted to God and vigorous in his old age. Six times it's recorded of Caleb this phrase, he hath fully followed the Lord. How cool is that? Like, I don't need a lot said over my life, but if they could say that, I'm down. He hath fully followed the Lord. Why? Because he understood the importance of that. His consecration was thorough. What magnificent adverbs were used to describe Caleb, and they were these. He followed faithfully, wholly, fully. He never lowered his standards, but he perpetually persevered and wholeheartedly fought. His courage was unfaltering. Giants did not disturb Caleb, nor did the men who were ready to stone him. And then it's interesting what he did. He he understood even more than that, and he turned it around, and he said this, He who attacks cureth Sefer and takes it to him, I will give my daughter as a wife. Caleb was not only a man of great and bold deeds, but he understood that, you know what, if you can conquer, I want you part of my family. Seriously. I think it's, I'm going to do it. You want to marry my daughter? That's fine. I want, I want to see you take some land, right? I'm joking, but I'm not. 
But listen to this. Maybe it isn't actually go out and kill giants and take land. What if it's this? What if you are a world changer? What if you don't take status quo as what you have to live in? What is it if you actually sit there and say, you know what, I'm going to take an area of this world and I'm going to do something no one else has ever been able to do before. My generation will be a different generation. Can I just tell you guys right now, my generation will see the greatest move of God ever seen. And you know why I say that? Because I'm going to be a part of bringing it forth. I'm sick and tired of a generation saying, maybe mine. No, God, this will be ours. You want to know the difference between Caleb and Joshua and the other spies? The other spy says, maybe it could work. And Caleb and Joshua says, no, it will work. Why? Because we will make it work. It isn't about the armies that we possess. It's about the God that we possess. So there was a young man that said, you know what? I can do that. I get land and I get marriage. And he stood up and he did that. He conquered a city to have her. And then it goes on, and we get to read further in here. Verse 18, one day when she came to Othniel, she urged him, her husband, to ask her father for a field. When she got off of her donkey, Caleb asked her, what can I do for you? And she replied, do me a special favor since you have given me land in the Negev and given me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. Why are we learning about this? A lot of times when people talk about Caleb, they talk about when he says, you know what, I'm this age and I'm ready to take the mountain. That's good. Don't, don't, don't discount that. That's a great thing. But why did I do this? Because there's a lot to be learned from this very small passage of Scripture in regards to what we need to do. How many people here, I said at the beginning, what we say, we get. Why is that? Agreed. That's excellent. This actually, this is a principle that works outside of the kingdom of God on a small scale. Uh, basically, how many people here have ever been like, you know what? I am going to write it down. I'm going to put a dream board on the wall. I'm going to have a vision casting session for my own life, and I will pursue that. Set God aside. I'll just pursue that. Nine times out of ten, you will accomplish that. But now listen, let's talk about a kingdom principle now. What happens whenever you sit there and say, Holy Spirit, give me your heart and mind, which we get as Christians, and then we speak from our mouth that which he gives us. Guess what's actually happening, and it's a beautiful thing. And don't trip on this with me. Follow me through this. When we speak that, we're actually speaking the word of God. Not, not this word of God I'm talking about. I'm actually talking about we have the breath of God inside of us, and when we speak it out, we're actually uttering that which heaven wants to happen on earth. So what does that look like? That doesn't look like, God, I need that new Ferrari. That's not God's voice working, I doubt. But this is what it looks like. You know what, God? I'm at a place where I need you to bring down your wealth into my life so that I can be an asset to this world for you. Whoa, wait a second. What's that? You're actually releasing things so that you can propel things. You want to know what I think is really, really sad? The broke church that has been of generations past. Why? Because they've traded wealth for poverty and called it righteousness. Think about that one for a second. They've traded wealth for poverty and called it righteousness. You want to know what we need? We need people that have wealth that are willing to invest into the things of God so that we can turn around that which the enemy has done. So what did his daughter do? He, she actually had the audacity to say, you know what, God? Dad, you've done really good, but I also want these. Why did she ask for the springs? What's water? Life. It's agriculture. It's prosperity. It's everything. If you have the water, you have the power, right? How many ranchers here are like, irrigation makes it happen? I love it. When it comes to August, you know exactly what has irrigation on it. It's brown and green. Why? Because water is life. So Caleb's daughter imitated the boldness of her father, which is incredibly important, and asked for a blessing. She did not hesitate to ask 
her father for the choicest of springs. Why? Because she's like, you know what? I've had boldness exemplified in my life, and I will walk in boldness. You know what I think God really wants? He isn't wanting a, ch- a-, a children who just brings the list of needs to him, but he's wanting the children that will ask him for those things that people would look at you and go, that's audacious. And God says, no, that's bold. The world is desperately wanting and needing people who will rise up with truth on their lips, boldness in their steps, who says, I will not back down until I take a mountain. Why are we at where we're at as a government right now? Because people haven't done that. Why are we at as a church where we're at in America? Because we've had people who have not done that. Why are we at where we're at as a family, in a family structure? Because we have people who have not done that. You know, I had the opportunity to see God work, and I've seen God work miracles in these areas. How many people know that God is for family? How many people know God is for for godly entertainment? How many people know? I mean, Casey said it this morning, this, this concept of seven mountains concept is a beautiful concept. Why? Because guess what, guys? We're called to take over the world. And we don't do it with guns. We don't do it with might and power and force. No, we do it with what? What's the tool of our takeover? Influence. Love is a part of it, but it's influence. Because guess what? The world desperately needs truth. What's the most contagious thing on the planet? Truth. Because guess what? Even the people who want to pervert it, they're interested in it. Truth speaks volumes. Truth will open up the opportunity to have influence. So you will become an influencer that speaks truth and you bring about change. What is that? It's wealth. Well, that has nothing to do with money. You're right. Bravo. You know what's so incredibly amazing to me is I've, the more I've studied, the more I've realized if money is the goal of prosperity, then you will always find yourself broke. If wealth of life is the goal, money will follow that. Why? Because money will actually then be attracted to you because guess what? You actually have value in of, of yourself and you don't put a price tag on your value. Might have lost some people there. Wealth is what we're called to. God is calling us to be in a place of excellence, a place of boldness and passion. Why did I preach on this this week? I was going to do it last week, but I felt like God wanted me to say that in that place of, of, of waiting is where you find equipping, and out of that equipping, then you find purpose. There's nothing wrong with taking a tarrying in the presence of God. But there's also a point of running passionately outside of that. I mean, the presence of God will follow you. But there's that place of of where where David would sit underneath the Ark of the Covenant and pen the Psalms, that place of of commune with God, that's that's where David found the power to go out and conquer nations. It wasn't in it wasn't in the the might and the power. No, it was in the it was out in the in, in the pastures with his harp. It was it was that was what we have to understand. That is required so we can walk into this. So what riches, what wealth do you possess? Let me explain a couple places. Spiritually, you possess so much wealth. Did you know that every single person in this place has the ability to hear the Holy Spirit and walk in it? God is literally, I view it as like, um, how how many people here have ever been able to witness a a forest fire? Like inside of a forest fire, not inside, but like close enough that you get it. Andrew, what happens to pine cones? They either fly or explode. And when they fly, what's the purpose of that? To spread the seed. Oh, we can preach. This preach is so easy, guys. So when fire hits a pine tree, now I was able to have, I'm not a forest fire. I'm not a wildland firefighter. I've never been a firefighter. I have very little knowledge of fires. 
when it comes to wildland, but there was one time that I found myself right smack dab in the middle of one with an old uh, wildland forest fire, and he's like, just keep up. Um, no, I did not have my red card. Um, but I was blown away. I was watching 70, 80 foot tall trees light like matches. And I would literally go, and the tree would be gone. But what was really amazing at this is it sounded like rifle shots. I'm like, what is that noise? And that guy said, he goes, it's all the seeds being planted. And I'm like, that's interesting. But then it literally was like flaming balls flying over us, igniting a lot more fires. <laughs> But I found something very interesting. C consider this. Spiritually, every one of us can hear the voice of God. Spiritually, I feel like God is saying, you know what, I'm igniting a fire inside of you guys that will propel you into the world around you where you will open up and what will come out of you will be the seeds required to birth another generation of you. Come on, you guys. Right? So that's what it is. That spiritual riches inside of you. The Holy Spirit is saying, open your mouth so I can use you. Oh, well, where? The grocery store. The convenience store. While well, you're pumping your gas next time. You open up, and guess what falls out? The seeds. The Holy Spirit seeds that will completely and utterly transform the lives around you. And I'm going to even stay a step further, and it'll transform your life. What was that? You have to be on fire. You want to know what? That's how the seeds are released. The heat opens so the seeds can drop. So you have riches in you spiritually. How many people know this? You have riches in you physically. You know what? I believe that there are ideas in this house that will spur the greatest economic change that this community has ever seen. What businesses are being birthed right in this moment? What ideas are coming to people's minds? Well, you know what? There was that one thing. If we could do this, this would happen. Run with it. Take the mountain. Why? Because we need you. You know what? What industry needs to be built on this ground? Because you guys, we actually, Casey and I had this conversation this week. I believe that Wheatland is poised for the greatest explosion or the, the worst fizzle. And I believe it's going to be up to the church. I believe the church is going to, and you want to know something? When righteous rule, the whole people prosper. So whenever there are people that say, you know what, I've got an ear to the heart of the Father and an ear to the need of the community, when we actually get to walk in those avenues, the whole entire world benefits. So physically, spiritually, how about financially? It goes right hand in hand, doesn't it? The physical is an area that will feed and birth that financial. How, much, how cool is it be if that you prosper even as your soul prospers, and then guess what? Your finances prosper. Your businesses prosper. Your marriage prospers. Guess what? A lot of times people sit there and say, hey, I need a fix, fill in the blank. Well, they're not willing to actually go after the root of the problem. They just keep trying to hack off the fruit of it. And then finally... Um, we have power in our dreams. Both the ones that come at night and the ones that come in the day. You want to know what dreams are, in my opinion? Direct Holy Spirit intervention and communication. Think about it. Have you ever had it where you're cruising down the road and you're like, that's a cool idea. I'm not trying to be mean, but it probably wasn't yours. God's like, hey, I know, isn't it? Run with it. So write down the dreams. I promise you, if you look back on your life, you will not look back and go, man, I wish I would not have taken the chances. You will look back on your life and say, I wish I would have taken them. Regret is the most miserable feeling, isn't it? It what if? That's a horrible statement isn't it? You see, it's a conscious choice whether we succeed and accomplish what we are called to in life. There are two large factors that stop most people. Drive and motivation to stick with one thing, focus. 
and procrastination and excuses. Those are the two things. Which, which category do you fall into? And I'm going to say this. Every one of us falls into one of them. Oh, I'm doing, there's more. You think that you're fully exercising everything God has for you? Buckle up. Imagine if we didn't give ourselves excuses. Imagine if there was no other options. The burn the bridge concept is a beautiful one. If we were held accountable for our success and failure, if we blame no one but ourselves for our outcome in life, that would give us a chance to look in the mirror, accept the truth, refocus, and continue the journey in the purpose that God intended for us. Amen? I had someone tell me once, they're like, you know what? I really don't like how you preach. And I said, why is that? They said, well, because every single week you challenge us to do something. And I said, well, I said, uh, then you better go to a place that doesn't do that because I won't quit. We need to challenge one another. We need Iron sharpens iron, right? As what? What's the rest of that? Does anyone know? As what? Wait a second. Do you know what that means? That means that I require of you whenever it's, t when the Holy Spirit tells you, you better come and you better chew on me. Hey, Jeremy, you know what? I felt like the Holy Spirit told me, fill in the blank. I want to challenge you today, Jeremy. We should be challenging one another. We should be building one another up. So today I challenge you to finish the things you've always wanted to do and inspire the world with your accomplishments. And at the end of your life, leave your grave empty. They can have a beaten, broken body and nothing else. How cool would that be? Could you imagine the power of the 130 people in this house right now? Could you imagine what we could do to this nation? Could you imagine what we could do to this state, to this world? The diseases that would be cured. Why? Because God gave you the mind to do it. You know what? God can supernaturally heal, and he can also give you the supernatural mindset that can give you freedom for the next generation to not have to deal with things like diabetes and cancer. Come on, right? What about the greatest nutritionalist that can sit there and say, you know what? These things are killing us. Let's get them out of our world. What about the ideas that say, you know what? I believe that I could invent the next greatest thing for the power industry that will transform our world in the realm of the power grid. We need it, guys. Let's go there. Let's have the dreams, and guess what? Let's keep them in this state so that we can become a wealthy state. You know how cool it would be if the world actually looked towards Wyoming and said, they got something figured out, and we can sit there and go, no, 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 God's got something figured out, and the church actually woke up. Make sure that poverty isn't your mode of righteousness, but wealth is. Because poverty will always leave you disillusioned to who God is, and the world will then be turned off by what God is. Wealth will show you truly who you are in Christ and the identity that he wants to place inside of you. Lack has no place in your life in Christ, in your thought process, in your nature and status, or in your wallet. Amen? God, we come right now and we thank you. We thank you that uh, the wealthiest place on earth isn't going to be our graves, but it's going to be the lives we live right now. God, I thank you that wealth has nothing to do with a financial number. It has everything to do with a life lived and walked out. But God, I thank you that that financial blessing and prosperity follows us whenever we live a life of wealth. And so, God, I just pray right now for every person here, God, as you start putting concepts and thoughts, maybe they've been there for years and they've been squelched or set down. God, we just pray release and freedom in the name of Jesus. Release them. Mindsets for business. Release them. Cures for cancer, diabetes, autoimmune disease, whatever it may be, release them. God, I pray in the spiritual healing and prophecy and, and tongues and interpretations, the gifts of the Spirit, release them. So God, I pray that we would be full and, and vibrant and healthy and world-changing. God, let us be a people that takes over every realm of the world around us so that when they look upon us, they sit there and say, wow, God's way really works. God, let's show the world that the gospel isn't broken but it holds the keys and the power to transform lives. And it still works. We thank you 
and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to really quick dive into communion. So if I could have, um, I need, uh, if I could have my board members come on up. Pastor Jim, come on up. Kyle, that's you. Mr. Kurt, would you mind joining us? Kurt did six years on our board. He actually termed out, and I haven't talked him back into coming back on, but we're working on it. Um, spiritual leader in my life and spiritual man of God. So if you guys want to just start handing out, um, and we got the crackers in the center. Thank you so much, Donnie and Lori, for doing this. You guys are amazing. If you could just hold the emblems until we t can partake together. Um, 2021, you guys. You know how excited I am that 2020 is gone? The elk aren't even moving like they're supposed to. I mean, it's not a good year, you guys. Um, but you guys, this is the coolest part ever. When the world is in turmoil, it's all the better time for the church to rise up and be what we're called to be. How cool is that? I mean, the world doesn't have answers, but we do. Let's walk in those answers, and let's show them something completely different. So uh, I love the fact that we together this Sunday, the second, third day, third day of January 2021, we get to partake in communion together, remember the sacrifice, and walk into the purpose. Like, you guys, this should dominate your mindset. If it isn't dominating your mindset, God, let it dominate their mindset. I pray that over you. And what is that? What am I saying, dominate? You should be waking up every morning and going, God, how am I the solution to the problem the world has? That's what God died for. So that you could be brought into a power that you couldn't possess on your own, that power, that dutimous power, that fire that God wants to place inside you, that it was given to you at the cross. That's why Jesus came, because I don't know if that that's way too deep for right now. No, it's way too deep for right now. So good, you guys. The power that we possess in Christ is that of Jesus. We should be looking like, acting like, walking like, and performing like Jesus did. How cool is that? I mean, that's like, hey, you know what? The lame are walking, the blind are seeing, uh, the the, yeah, it's so good. Yeah, the deaf are hearing, right, Wayne? Amen. And this is the cool part. It, even if it's just because of old age, that doesn't mean God can't heal it, right? God's all about restoration. So Jesus had this crazy rabble of boys. Like, if you actually look at it, most of the disciples were teenagers when they were called. They were early 20s when they came through. Thank you, brother. Early 20s. Now, let me ask this question. How many, I need young men between the age of 15 and 25 to raise your hand. Gabe, okay, one, two, three, three, four. Get your hand down. We need to change that and get more young men here. Let's just say this. 35 and under raise your hand for men. Okay, so if I were to take the people raising their hands and put them all together for three years, are you, do you think there's any craziness that's going to abound in that group? Yeah, you know it. And this is, the other, this is the other thing. I don't think Jesus was what we think he was. I think Jesus probably egged it on. One of my favorite parts of, the, of the, the Chosen series is the fact that they created a, a representation of Jesus that was in no way, shape, or form stuck up. He was, I mean, he was making fun of Andrew dancing. I mean, but it's like that's, that's the type of Jesus figure I really can picture. Why? Because he was a real man who had a real calling. So these disciples were there, and they... But because they were really good, they were Jewish, 
And they understood, they came into this Passover meal and it got serious. It would have been serious. I'm not saying there wouldn't have been a little bit of unserious, but as a whole, it got serious. And Jesus, they had had this crazy passion week coming up to this day where they're like, it's getting a little electric around here. I mean, we're talking triumphant entry. We're talking healings. We're talking turning over tables in a temple. They're like, man, he's about to take over some Roman rule even. He's, he's getting really bold. Like, we've seen him out, out the outskirts and outlying, but now it's getting real. And so Jesus comes, and he, he sends them to find the house, and they found the house, and they prepared the meal, and they came into this upper room. And as they sat around, and they ate, and they drank, and they went through the Passover meal, afterwards he brought it to a very serious note. He said this. He said, hey, guys, by the way, this is my body, which was broken for do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you, whenever you partake, do it in remembrance of me. And why did he say this? Because he wanted them to understand that generations would pass, but the story could never diminish. Why? Every generation needs the gospel. Did you know we're one generation away from an unreached people group? In Wheatland? In America? One generation. I had a nine-year-old this year who had never heard anything about the gospel. Did not know about Moses. Did not know about Noah. Did not know about a baby born in a manger or a man dying on a cross. They were like, well, I think I've seen that on a necklace. A nine-year-old. You know what that is? That isn't Euro-Asia. That isn't the 1040 window. That isn't Africa. That's Wheatland Wyoming. You guys, we have unreached people groups. Jesus says, hey, whenever you partake, whenever you come together, when you meet, when you break bread, remember me. Why? Because the sacrifice I'm giving right now, it's life-giving. It's life-changing. So he said, take this and do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the body broken. We thank you for a life given, and God, we thank you for a, a, just a, a, a charge given. Go into all the world. Go everywhere. Don't stop. Share it everywhere. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake. It's really loud in here. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, hey, guys, uh, you know all of that bondage that you've known your whole life as a Jew? I'm eliminating it right now. There's the paraphrase. That's what it was. Hey, you know those 634 rules that you can't keep? Guess what? I'm going to give you two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually fulfilling the law, not ab ab obliterating it. I'm fulfilling it. And I'm taking an old covenant and destroying it. And I'm putting a new covenant in place. A covenant that actually puts you in a position of family instead of servanthood. That's what this represents right here. Think about that. That isn't, oh, let's be somber about this. No, that's like, oh, yeah. That's a good thing, you guys. Guess what? You're good enough. Guess what? Your past doesn't matter anymore. Amen? Come on. Hey, guess what? I'm going to even go a step further. You're not allowed to hold anyone's past over them. Because God can't. Did I say can't? I said can't. For I forgave you and I cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. And what? I chose to remember it no more. So whenever you're like, hey, God, do you remember? And he's like, no. No, you remember that one time? No. It's not there. I free you from your past right now. God does too. Took the cup and he said, hey, new covenant. This one works. Last one didn't. Let's pray. God, I thank you for blood shed, life changed, covenant transformed, God. You gave us so much on that moment. God, whenever your blood was shed, God, our healing was brought. When your blood was shed, the covenant was sealed. And three days later, the whole world knew. 
the demonic, they, they couldn't believe that. <laughs> they had failed. A new covenant was established. The second Adam restored that which the first Adam lost. And God, we stand in right standing because of it. And I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake. God, you are a good father. You are amazing at what you do. And so, God, I pray that 2021 would be a year that we understand the greatest place of wealth on earth, and that is in every single one of us. Not because of... uh, not because of a certain formula or anything. It, it simply is this. God, you don't create trash. And when you live inside of us, we truly can become what you call us to be. So every person on this, in this uh, place, every person that's hearing my voice, be it on a live or being in person, God, I pray that you would show them that they, they possess wealth beyond measure and that, God, you are going to use them to change the world. Give us God ideas and give us the passion and power to run with them. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Happy.